Hi, welcome back to the Progressive Primitivist, where we believe the only way to go forward in religion is to go back to the Bible. I'm your co-host, Jake Hysaw. You are watching one of a series of videos where we will be sharing audio recordings from the Question and Answer Open Forum at the Freed Hardman Lectureship moderated by Guy Ian Woods and Gus Nichols from 1967 to 1973. We felt that these recordings were a blessing to us and our ministry here at the Progressive Primitivist and felt the need to share them and make them easily accessible here on YouTube. Now, we would like to preface and say that we don't endorse every answer uh, given in these recordings, but we do feel that they're a blessing to the body of Christ as we all are just here to pursue truth. Now, be sure to leave a like on our video and comment if you uh, like our content and would like to see more videos like this. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, that way you can see every time that we post videos like this. But more importantly, be sure to share this with someone that you believe would benefit from a study like this. And now, here's the open forum. Lectureship, 1967, Wednesday, open forum, Guy in Woods. Due to the age of this tape, the session is already in progress. Also, only side one will be available. And I believe I have a real spirit in me. And that this spirit is alive. And it's a living thing. A mysterious thing? Oh, yes, I don't understand it. But there's just a lot of things I don't know about deity. But I believe that deity is manifold more wonderful than we've ever imagined. And I believe the Holy Spirit, like a human spirit, is a mysterious thing to us. And that all we can know about it, what the Bible says about it. I do not believe that it makes revelations to Christians. I do not believe that he miraculously or in any way guides us other than by the word of God as he has revealed his word. Spirit revealed his word in and through inspired men now in the Bible. I do not believe that he uh, guides us, brings to our memory scriptures, and so on. If he does, why, when I'm tired, he does a poor job of it. <laughs> right when I need him most. Maybe I forget. And I'm not infallible in my teaching. You're not. We're to be governed by the Bible. And as Brother Wood says, that's the main issue. Now, there are Christians who do not think that the Holy Spirit's any closer than heaven. And he hadn't been down here in 1,800 years since the last people died that the apostles laid hands on. And uh, I think a person be a Christian and believes that. But I feel that there is a comfort in believing those many plain passages that simply says that the Holy Spirit himself dwells in Christians. Like Acts 5 and 32, so also is the Holy Ghost, whom uh, God hath given to them that obey him. Whom God hath given. Some have said it's eternal life. Well, that will be in the world to come. Nobody would have the Holy Ghost now. Acts 2.38 put the gift of the Holy Ghost after uh, baptism and after the remission of sins. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's his promise. And I believe that promise is still being fulfilled every time one obeys the gospel. That God gives him the gift of the Holy Ghost, and that that's the Holy Ghost himself as a gift, as in Acts 5.32. So also is the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. And I believe that all Christians have the Holy Ghost whether they know it or not. I believe that uh, all people, all human beings have a human spirit whether they believe it or not. Adventists, Russellites, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christadelphians and others who deny that they have a human spirit also have one just like the rest of us. And they could lose their souls just like the rest of us. Matthew 16, 26. So I don't think it is something to spend a lot of time about. I do think that the people ought to have access to the information that may be available in argument concerning the matter from both sides, and then each make up his mind and let's get on with the Lord's business. <clears throat>
Thank you, Brother uh, Nichols, and I appreciate fully Brother Nichols' statement. He and I are agreed that the issue is this. Does the Holy Spirit, apart from the Word, exercise an influence upon people to the extent that they're led in addition to or independent of the Word of Truth? He said the other afternoon that to teach such is dangerous doctrine. That's the real issue. Now, insofar as the manner and mode of the Spirit's dwelling, Brother Nichols correctly says that it is a mysterious matter. I do not affect to know exactly how the Holy Spirit uses His powers and why He does. I know what the Bible says with reference to it, but as he pointed out, it's a mysterious matter. And there will be differences of opinion about the manner in which the Spirit exercises His power. But that's not the question. The brethren have, through the years, had differences of opinion on that subject. But the real issue is, and the one that, will, that is, uh, involves the dangerous aspect of it, does the Spirit operate independently of the Word? Some are saying that it does, that it does things to us that the Word cannot do. Brother Nichols and I oppose that view. Now, <clears throat> I would like to say this in response to, to a, a statement he made, that is, uh, that with reference to the Holy Spirit being in heaven, I believe the Holy Spirit is here on earth, that he was sent to abide here upon earth forever. I also believe that Christ is here, but I don't think that he's here in the same sense that he's in heaven. He's at the right hand of God, in some sense, on the throne, that he's not here upon earth. It is a fact that there is such a thing as omnipresence. But then we must be forced to the conclusion that there is some sense in which the Lord is one place and not another, even though in another sense he's everywhere. And so um, I see no difficulty involved in that particular point. Yes. Yes. I um, want to say something on this subject which has nothing to do with the indwelling of the Spirit necessarily, but for a historical perspective. Let me say just a word to our younger men and some others perhaps about the relationship of this spirit business to the rise of modernism and the influence that it is beginning to have among some of our brethren. We can argue and fuss all day long on the subject of the indwelling of the Spirit. But the real crucial problem that we at the college are on the cutting edge of is this business of authority in religion. Now there's the battle. Now for several hundred years, the subject of the existence of God was not a major issue. But in the days of Mohammedanism, and in the days where Christianity, as it was in the 1200s, came in conflict with paganism in uh, Europe and Spain, it became necessary to establish on rational grounds an argument for the existence of God. At least it was assumed to be true. For a number of years, the work of Thomas Aquinas in Summa Theologica and Summa Contra Gentiles was the argument from design, from the world, and from uh, morality, etc., the five ways. There was a man by the name of Hume, a Scottish philosopher, who on the basis of a particular theory he had of how a man knows, felt that he had undermined the argument for the existence of God and for miracles. He was followed by another man by the name of Kant, a German. They trained their guns upon the arguments they thought for the existence of God on the basis of the cosmological argument, the teleological, and the moral argument. A number of people began to recognize some difficulty. There was a man by the name of Schleiermacher, a German. Schleimacher endeavored to avoid the dilemma of either believing in God on the basis of rational argument or give up the belief in the existence of God. And instead, he said, you adopt a religion of feeling, 
a religion in which you become united with God through a kind of mystical experience. And this is the ground of your authority in religion. And right here is where liberalism had its foundation. As a result of this particular attitude or disposition of mind, men began to seek to find a way by which they could be religious and at the same time reject specific teachings of the Bible. Here is where the rise of what is called higher criticism came in. Here is where the idea of the errors in the Bible came in. That you do not have to believe that the Bible is inerrant. It makes no difference. The only thing that matters is whether or not the Bible serves as a kind of a streamer that you take hold of and swing out and somewhere out there you meet God. And when you meet Him out there, this experience kind of validates it. Now, if this is the apologetic, if you want to call it that, if this is the ground of your certainty, it makes no difference whether the Bible is in or not. It makes no difference whether the Bible came by the inspiration of the Spirit. Nothing matters. Here is where the idea that the works of Milton and Shakespeare and others may be just as good and just as meaningful as a way to get to God. Well, this was cleverly articulated. The attack was made upon the Scripture and the rise of science in the 1700s and later came in with all of its ideas. And it wasn't too long until men began to say, Look, we must choose between faith and reason. This is the battle. It was the battle then. It's still the battle now. This is not the choice. This is not it at all. And our brethren are making mistakes when they are in seminaries or when they read books that tell them you must choose between faith and reason. And when you've made the choice, then you validate your faith by some kind of an experience. Now, if you'll read the works of Amy Simple McPherson, you'll read the works of Barrett in Norway, you'll read the works of the Pentecostal people, this is how they validate their belief in the Bible. They say, we believe in the Bible because we've had an experience that transcends what's in the Bible. And this is where the man will say, I'd rather have what I've got in my heart than all the Bibles. Now, our brethren have faced this in some seminaries. They have faced it and they have not been able to grapple with it because they have not been trained. Or if they have been trained, they have not been grounded in the faith. Some of you may not realize the attacks that can be made against your faith by clever, articulate men who know the arguments as well or better than you do, who have specialized in this. And when you do battle with a man in his field, you must have your sword sharpened. And some men have not been able to do it. And consequently, since they do not wish to reject religion, they say, instead of rejecting religion, I then will have the ground of my certainty in the work of the Holy Spirit that guides and leads me. Good people, this is a very serious issue with me. We might uh, war around here for six months on the indwelling of the Spirit. But the ultimate tap root of it is the authority of the Bible. This is the problem. And when we are led off the issue and fussing and warring and striving and fighting among ourselves and trading pot shots here and there and so on about uh, who's right on the indwelling of the Spirit, whether it's the Word only or the Word through the Spirit or in conjunction with and all of this terminology, we're off in the backwater back here somewhere. The real battle is the authority of the Scriptures, and with it goes the whole plea of churches of Christ. We do not need to sacrifice one point and let the issue be clear that the personal indwelling of the Spirit, whether you call it mode or fact or how, is not the problem. That isn't it. And when our young men have been led in classrooms to believe that the only way you can have authority in religion is for the Holy Spirit to speak in your heart and lead and guide you, he's wrong, just like the Pentecostals are. Well, there's more to say on that, but I wanted to say that. I'm not afraid, I am not one bit afraid of the philosopher, of the textual critic, 
of the scientist or what not. Our faith does not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the message of God in His Word. But that message from God is not counter to reason. A perverted reason, yes. But we need not fear the arguments for the existence of God and special revelation. We need not fear to make those arguments. You may not have studied all of the intricacies of the cosmological argument, but that's beside the point. We need men who are trained and who are qualified to do battle on every field. Men who are sound and solid in the faith. And what we must not have in our brotherhood is for the men who are out in the front lines, out on the local church level, and the men who are in the colleges and who are in the places of administrative responsibility in our college, fighting and warring and fussing among themselves. Let there be an end of suspicion. Let there be an end of fear. Let us meet across the table from each other and talk and discuss as brethren, not as men who are educated versus men who are uneducated. This is not the question. As a matter of fact, in terms of such men as Gus Nichols and Guy Woods, it isn't a question of who's educated and who's not. It's a question of how they got it versus how the other fellow got it. That's the only question. And let this business of some men who are under suspicion, who are educated men, let this die among us. Let the men who are under suspicion because they do not have a BA or an MA or a PhD, let that die among us. We are brethren in Christ, and we do not fear to stand together. I hope that that at least generates some interest. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> I'm afraid Brother Woods misunderstood one thing that he said, and that was that we might depend upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit and his leading us or something like that. And he meant to say, I'm sure, but that we should not depend upon a direct guidance of the Holy Spirit, a miraculous guidance apart from the Word and the Bible. He didn't mean to take the position that the Holy Spirit does not guide us nor direct us through the work, but that we should not depend upon some other guidance and direction. Is that yes. right, Brother Woods? Yes. <coughs> well, thank you, Brother Woods. Yes. Yes, come around. Uh, I have something I want to say. The record of what I just said. A brother retired here said that in California he said that he'd stay at the truth and not. Thank you, Brother Glenn Wallace, and may I say, friends, um, that I appreciate fully all of these statements. I appreciate the background that was characteristic of Brother Woodson's statement. With one or two of the points made, I would disagree. Number one, I do not believe 
that the course of the cause of Christ rests necessarily in the hands of those who have gone on to higher education. I am not opposed to higher education of the right type. I do not uh, accept the argument, though, that's made that that's where the battleground is. Those men, the men that would normally be contacted on that level, have already rejected the Bible and are not susceptible of conversion. Let me ask this question. How many of our brethren on that level have converted how many people in that category? Paul says, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble after the flesh are called. That class of people have already repudiated Christianity. The cause of Christ, the hope of the cause of Christ, rests in the ordinary people. And the Bible is our source of authority. We don't have to be convinced that it's true. We believe that it is. But I remind you, brethren, that the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. We must keep the cause of Christ pure. And it, the, these matters have to be fought out. If they were not fought out, there wouldn't be anything to fight for in another generation. I'm aware of the fact that some squeamish brethren quit taking religious papers because they say there's always a battle going on. Well, it's good that there is a battle going because if we didn't stand up and fight for the truth, soon there wouldn't be anything in our generation to fight for. And so we'll continue to fight, and we won't be deterred by any sort of so-called uh, intellectual opposition to it. I'm amazed at the recklessness with which some brethren on that level are dealing with uh, the matter at the present time. I'm not referring now to anybody here at Freed Hardeman. But I'm going to show tomorrow how that they cannot deal fairly and honestly even with quotations uh, from brethren in the past. We'll deal with that tomorrow because the time is gone. You sure may. Come right up here. We just got about a minute now. For the past two years, I've been thrown into an environment that typifies a great deal of what has been said today. This is not in criticism of them, but in criticism of ourselves. When somebody stands up and talks about what the philosophers believe and the various dogmas of our day, and the preachers out in the congregations don't understand what the man is saying, they go off in criticism of the man. But they go off without the challenge to understand what some of the perplexing problems that, are, that is facing the church today is. They go off and they, the preachers sit down in the chairs. They go and get them a sermon outline book. They will not dig to find out what these problems are that they will be able to face them. And then we want to criticize the man who will dig and find what these problems are and try to meet them face on. This is one of the big problems to me that faces the preachers of today. That they get off the stool of do-nothing, quit whittling on the stick of do-less, and whistling to the tune of I don't care, and try to find out where we are. In so many ways, the world could pass us by and forget us, and we will never touch it. But until we understand some of these problems of philosophy, we will never be able to take the Word of God and meet these arguments. You can't meet an, art an argument, you can't meet a problem unless you understand it. And until we get our hearts set to understanding what some of these atheistic people are trying to put over on us, we'll never bring the United States back to Jesus Christ. In essence, it's lost today. And many in the church, I'm afraid, are in that category. Not that they've gone so far out in liberalism. But we're sitting by complacent and saying the Lord will help us and lead us and bring us to victory. The Lord will not do for us what we can accomplish for ourselves.
sir. End of the beginning of 15. No, the Spirit's going to fall at the end here. All right. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, but when it came my time to talk with this laryngitis, I wasn't able to say much. I'd just love to say a few words, though, about our program. I think, when I think about 15 years ago last October, a man walked into my office and said, Brother Hart, what do you think about a national radio program? Had I been jealous and envious because I was not the speaker, I might have held in my hand that day the destiny of multiplied thousands of people. Had I just said, no, I'm not for it, this man would have left, for he told me of the day. We'd tried, we'd gone to Nashville and other places, nobody would help us. I knew you'd been on radio for years. I hoped that you wouldn't say no. I meant to turn and leave and not come back. I knew the worth of it. And I said, Brother Kendrick Sr., we're long overdue on it. I'm ready to do anything I can. The man was happy. We called the elders. And I said to the elders, let me have time to ask some people and see what they have to say about it. I don't want a brotherhood fight. I'm not physically able at that time to do it. The brotherhood's been torn in these things, and if we're going to have that, I certainly don't want it. I talked to the men that were bosom friends of mine, and the men to whom I talked that I wanted to talk personally said, Brother Harper, I see no harm in it. We'll announce it. I called the elders together and asked them. I said, Brethren, so far as the preacher's concerned, I'm ready to give you the green light. We started 15 years ago with fewer than 100 stations. I wish I had time to tell you today about them. Today we're on between 900 and 1,000 radio and television stations. We cover almost, well, much of the world. We're on in Nigeria, Liberia. We're on in uh, Hawaii, in Alaska. We're on in Canada, Australia, the Philippine Islands, Central America, up and down this country. We cover Spain and the nations about it. From London, we cover London on down in to some of the countries round about them. And then we're in the great land from which my people came, that of Scotland and in Ireland. And then about three months ago, we were given the Armed Force Radio Network. Over 300 stations, absolutely free. And that means we're on around 800 radio stations in every English-speaking encampment in the world, nearly. And then, in addition to that, we're on 155 television stations. We have a letter stating to us, if you will guarantee us a new film, we'll guarantee you a minimum of 40 stations in color, a maximum of 60. We guarantee you, you can be on over 200 stations in 12 months. That would mean that we'll receive from a million to a million five hundred thousand dollars of free television time, we were not able to say we'll take it. We need help to produce these films. These films, good people, will cost nearly ten thousand dollars, and then it costs around twenty two hundred dollars to make the twenty reprints before we can ever use one of them. But if we could, we can be on in twelve months on two hundred television stations covering almost the entirety of our country. Would you let us come into your sections? Would you go back to the churches where you are and the counties where you are and ask them to help us accept this? For one time it's gone, and it's hard to get it back. That's where we are, a million dollars of free television time. And we had to say, we can't accept it, for we can't guarantee that film. Won't you help us to guarantee it? I wish I had an hour to tell you about where it's going, the people that are listening, and the great opportunities. And I believe I could rejoice your heart. But just think about it. Between 900 and 1,000 radio and television stations beaming the gospel of Christ to multiplied millions in our time. I believe that you'll help us. I close with this little story about a minute. It said there were some missionaries who went into foreign country. And among that number, a young boy and a young girl, and they fell in love. This young girl became kind of aggravated at him, like girls will, bless their little hearts, and your wives too. And she told him, she said, I hope I never see you again. Well, he took her at her word, and he left. 
The next day he didn't come back. She made sure he'd understand that she's crazy about him and he couldn't stay away, but she, he didn't. A week passed, a month passed. He didn't show up. She sat down and wrote a letter, a love letter, apologizing and begging him to come back. She didn't mean that. She gave it to her brother and said, will you deliver this? And he said yes and put it in his pocket. And like most of us in our Lord's work, he forgot. A year passed, he didn't come. Years went on, he met another girl and married her. Twenty-five years passed, her brother died. And going through the effects, they found this old coat. Inside that coat pocket, that was the undelivered love letter. She knew then why her lover never came back. Now, my friends, we have today God's love letter. And that love letter came from heaven. Here's that love letter today. And that love letter said this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is God's love letter. We are that brother. He's committed to us to take it to the world. May I say this to you? Let us not come to the judgment. Then when it begins to go through the effects of his people upon this earth, let him not find in our effects God's undelivered love letter asking the world to come to him. When we have the love letter and we have every opportunity, world radio, our radio, the printed page, everything together, let's take God's love letter to the people because somebody brought it to us. Will you go back home and help us to accept this million dollars of free color television time asking us if we'd take it. We can't say yet that we can. God's love letter. Let's deliver it. Amen. Again, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you like our content, if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you leave a thumbs up on our video and you comment uh, what you thought in the comment section. But also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can see uh, our content and whenever we post content. And make sure you follow us on our social medias in the description below. Uh, thank you again. See you next time.